This mini PC has dual 10 gig SFP plus ethernet. It has dual two and a half gig ethernet, dual USB four ports that support Thunderbolt three devices and a low profile PCIe expansion slot. All of that means that this mini PC has almost every feature folks have been asking for, for these mini PCs as servers and even workstations. There's a lot here, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH and this is the Minis Forms MS-01. This mini PC has a ton of features that folks have been asking for. And let me give you an example. We've reviewed systems like this Lenovo and folks have said that these things would be perfect if they just, you know, handle one more SSD plus some more networking or something like that. And what Minisform has managed to do is fit a ton of functionality into a system that's not much bigger than a Project Tiny Mini Micronode. It is definitely bigger and you can kind of see that right here as I have them lined up. And so when the product designer from Minisform actually got on the STH forums back, I think like in August, 2023, they were like, hey, you know, we have this new idea. What do you guys think about it? And I was like, okay, this is cool. We will definitely review this if you send me one. And so they did send one. And we did an article just before the end of the new year. And we also did a short on our new shorts channel, STH Labs. If you haven't checked it out, definitely go do that. Now, there are definitely things in this system that we found that are undocumented and are completely awesome. On the other hand, there are definitely some things in here that I really want folks to know before they buy this system. There are things in the system, like there's a switch that if you have it switched the wrong way, you could potentially kill your M.2 SSD. When we started testing things in the PCIe slot, there were cards that just didn't work. And those are just two examples of some of the things that I want to go into. So during our key lessons learned, we're going to go look at a whole bunch of of different configurations. I'm going to talk through some of the things that we learned while using the system. Frankly, the base hardware is completely awesome and I do really like the system, but if you try expanding it, you're going to find some things that, um, well, I think are really important to know before you buy one. And at this point, I also just want to say a quick thank you to the STH YouTube members who are subscribing and helping us get the budget to go buy all the little cards and stuff that we put into a system like this so we can test it out and give you a better idea of how it works. Gen if you can support us, that would be great because it means that we can go buy more stuff to go test in these systems. With that, Let's get to the hardware. Okay, so looking at the front system, you're gonna see that we have a power switch. We also have our combo audio jack, and then we have a couple of USB ports. Now there are two USB 2 ports, and these are really for things like your mouse and keyboard. There's also a USB 3 type A port. So if you have like a USB flash drive or something like that, that's always useful. And frankly, if that were the main features of the system, it would be super boring, but you're gonna see a couple of other things that are pretty cool as we get to the back. On top and on bottom, you do have venting. And the venting is very important because this is a pretty high power system, even though it's a pretty small system. What we don't have is we don't have vents on the sides. We do have a Minis Forum branding, which is kind of nice that it's not crazy big and it's just still there. Okay, so getting to the back of the system, this is where the magic really happens. And the first thing I'm gonna point out is not even a port. Instead, there is a low profile PCIe slot. So you do need a low profile bracket, but you can install a low profile PCIe card here. Next to that, you're going to see some venting because uh, this system definitely needs it. Now on the bottom, we get two SFP plus ports. Now these SFP plus ports are powered by an Intel X710 NIC, which is a pretty high quality NIC. Now the next feature are two two and a half gig ethernet ports, but there's something different. Now, normally in a lot of the mini PCs we see, they just use Intel I226Vs, but this one has a Intel i 226 LM and that LM is important because that's what allows you to get management features. In a lot of the corporate PCs, for example, you'd have an Intel i219 LM, which was the one gig version of this i226 LM. And that i226 LM has the ability to run a management interface, which gives you access to Intel vPro. Now Intel vPro is not as good as the IPMI that you would see on servers. It's really meant for desktop and like remote troubleshooting and like corporate environments where you're doing that kind of thing from an IT help desk perspective. The other side to it, though, is that it is still pretty useful. You can do things like you can do remote power cycle, you have a remote KVM feature, and you can also mount remote media. I just wanna say personally for a server, I am a much bigger fan of IPMI and baseboard management controllers, but this does have some functionality. But since we don't have that in the system, this is a decent compromise. Now having four network ports, two 10 gig and two two and a half gig are pretty awesome, but there's even more high speed IO because there are two USB four ports. Now these USB four ports can do things like they can you know, be display out Outputs, so there are a total of three display outputs on the back of this. The other thing that you can do though is you can plug in high speed USB devices or you can even connect things like Thunderbolt 3 adapter. So if you wanted to have like a 10G based team Thunderbolt 3 adapter, you can go plug that in or something like that. And that is absolutely awesome. There's also an HDMI port for video output. And then there are two USB 3 type 
A ports. Finally, there's a 19 volt power input. Now, 19 volts for these things is very common, but what's not common is the size of the power brick. Now, this is a 180 watt power brick, which is, uh, you know, a pretty decent sized power brick, if you ask me. Okay, that's enough of our external hardware overview. Let's get inside the system to see all of the really fun and funky things that are in here. Okay, now one of the things that the Minis Forums guys did a great job on is designing the way that you get into the system. So there's this like little lever here and you just pop it out and then the system comes out. Now, once you're inside the unit, we're gonna do a quick overview. You have the memory and CPU fan over here. The CPU, the Core i9 CPU is over on this side. This is the area for our low profile PCIe slot. And then when we flip around to the other side, that's when we get to our storage and our wireless networking. So you're gonna see up in this corner that we have our RZ616, which is our Wi-Fi 6E solution. A little bit weird that we have an Intel platform in our Z616, but still, that's what we get. And then we have under our cooling shroud, we have our three M.2 slots, although you're going to see that we have a U.2 drive there. We're going to get to that. Okay, so first, let's start with the CPU and memory area. Now, one of the weird things about this is that although the entire chassis is pretty easy to service, um, the memory is a little hard to get to. Well, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily hard to get to, but you have the three little screws to get in there. And once you undo the screws, you're going to be able to just go and pop this little shroud out and this has your fan in it so you can see that we have our fan and i just kind of wish that this was toolless right like kind of the hp guys they have that little mechanism where they just kind of like clamp it in i mean it's just it's awesome right the one thing i want to show you guys that we have in here which is pretty exciting is that this system normally comes with 32 gigabytes of ddr5 memory now 32 gigabytes is well and good 216 gig dims is probably all you really need but of course there are a lot of folks like me that like to have at least 64 gigabytes of memory and the supported memory configuration in this is going up to two 32 gig SODIMs and that gives you 64 gigabytes total. Now, something that is not an officially supported configuration, but we tried and it worked, was we tried two crucial 48 gig DDR5 5600 DIMMs and they worked no problem, giving us a total of 96 gigabytes of memory. Okay, now the other big feature on this side, of course, is the low profile PCIe slide, which I think a lot of folks are going to want to utilize. Now, there's a normally a cover here and the design of it is, mm, I would say, mediocre at best. Now, to be able to install a card, you have this little retention mechanism, which is like a little springy clip. Hopefully you guys can, you guys can see this thing. Um, and there's a little screw that's on the top and it goes up in this kind of corner up here. Now, one of the reasons that this design is really cool is that it works. One of the negatives of this design is that it's, um, I, I frankly fumbled this every time we did it and we installed something like 20 or 30 cards at this point. So um, I, I would definitely say that this is not my favorite design. I also think that and we're gonna show you a card that specifically hits this a little bit later and we found a couple that did, but this little nub back here where this thing sits, frankly, it shouldn't be there. That, that nub actually prevents you from installing installing some cards. And so what you can do if um, if you really want to, and we didn't know this when we were doing the B-roll, but we figured it out a little bit later, is that there are little clips to take this faceplate off. And so for some cards, because of this design, you may have to actually take this back faceplate off to be able to like actually put the card in just because, and it's just a weird design. So I don't know why it's there. Now flipping the unit around, we get to our storage area. And one of the kind of cool things that this system has is it actually has a fan, which cools the SSDs that are down here, which by by the way, is a super important thing on a small chassis like this. We see a lot of systems that don't have the proper cooling on the bottom, especially for like SSDs, and that just tends to be a, a bad recipe these days. Now, once you get the three screws off, and it, again, I wish that this was toolless, but it's not at this point, um, you, you can actually pull out this little shroud, and you'll see that there's a little blower fan here, and it may not seem exciting, the fact that there's a blower fan, but it actually has a big impact on what you can do with the system. Well, I guess it doesn't like two ways because this portion is where a U.2 seven millimeter SSD would basically fit. And that means that this fan protrudes a little bit from this faceplate. That may not seem like a big deal until you realize that if you want to go and put an SSD with a heatsink on, well, it would have to be under this fan, which is pretty darn hard to do. Now, once you get the fan shroud off, you can now get into the main part with the SSDs. And you kind of, by the way, have to, if you do put a U.2 drive in here, you're gonna have to hold this a little bit. But what you'll see here is that we have 
First, our RZ616, which is our Wi-Fi 6E solution. So this does have Wi-Fi as well. But then we get an array of three different M.2 slots. Now, the boot drive for this is this Kingston SSD. And that's the one that we got with the system. It's a one terabyte drive. And something that the drive had on it, which I'm just gonna show you guys real quick. You'll see it in some of the photos probably, but it had this little heat sink on it, which was cool. But you'll notice that it has this these rubber bands. And the reason that these rubber bands are really here, I think, is because um, there's not a ton of clearance underneath the SSDs. They sit pretty darn close to the motherboard. The motherboard has components on it. And so I think that you have to have something like this kind of like heat sink with rubber bands or something like that if you even want to go put it. And you can only use that in the far slots. You can only use it in this kind of far slot down here. Otherwise it will run into the fan. Now, Mini's forum sent us a couple of drives just to kind of show you this. These are not like huge capacity drives or anything like that, but you, they do have the ability to have either M.2 2280 or M.2 22110, which is what the Samsung drive is. Now this third M.2 slot that we currently have a U.2 drive in, I'm gonna pull this out real quick. Uh, this is actually the one that our Kingston drive was originally installed in. So we found it with the heatsink and it was down there when it originally arrived from the factory. But there are other things that you can do with that slot. So of course we took off the heatsink and we moved the original drive. And what you'll see here is that we have our M.2 slot and we have our 80 millimeter and our 110 millimeter mounting points. So you can put either size drive in this slot as well. There's a little bit offset from the other, so it looks a little bit not neat, but um, there is kind of a reason for that. And the reason for that is because it comes with this little adapter here. Now this adapter has an M.2 connector on one side, and then it also has a U.2 just kind of interface here. Now, this U.2 interface allows you to use a U.2 SSD, but it doesn't allow you to use any U.2 SSD. Most likely, if you're going to go buy a U.2 SSD, you're probably going to get like a 15 millimeter drive. And a 15 millimeter drive is just simply too thick for a system like this. So you have to use a 7 millimeter drive, which limits your performance options. It limits your capacity and all that kind of stuff as well. And so the way that this works is that you install this in the M.2 slot, and then it uses the uh, fan uh, portion, the fan shroud, to go and kind of secure this at two different points. But I think you can see it's actually pretty easy to go and install this thing. It makes a lot of sense how it works. But then we get to the kill switch. There is a switch up here that has two different settings, U.2 and M.2. And there is a huge warning label below it. And the reason for that is because this switch changes the voltage supplied to the SSD. Now, if you've ever used an M.2 to U.2 adapter, you'll know that you always have to go and add like, you know, auxiliary power into that because you don't have the right voltages going over the line. U.2 is frankly designed for higher power and that's really one of the design goals. So it's a different voltage running in it. This little switch changes the voltage of that M.2 slot, which means that if you have this set to the U.2 setting and you put in an M.2 SSD, there is a decent chance you are going to destroy your drive. But let me just show you real quickly the problem with this, right? So you'll see that we have our M.2 U.2 thing there, which is the label for the switch. Now, when we put this drive in, and with this drive in, you're gonna see that you can't see that M.2 and U.2 label. So instead, you don't really know when you have the U.2 drive installed, like which one it's on. And even though this has a warning label and all that kind of stuff, I do think that this is gonna end up hurting someone's SSD one day. It's just a part of the design and that's kind of what it is. So if you've watched this video, don't do that. Other just little tiny features I just wanna point out real quick is that we have an SRK TV NIC over here and this bottom one is the SRK TV. T. So that is how you know if you have the i226V or i226LM. Okay, so let's get to the performance before we get to our power consumption noise. And then we're going to finish up with our key lessons learned, which is really just going to be a big plug fest. And we're going to show you all the cool things that we did with this system, specifically that PCIe slot. Okay, so looking at the performance of this, this is an Intel Core i9-13900H. And when we ran the system, you see that we get pretty darn good performance. We get really about the performance that we've seen of this processor in other systems. There wasn't really any difference, especially when we didn't have anything installed in the PCIe slot. Now, something to note that if you do like install like a GPU or something into the PCIe slot, it will lower the power limits on the CPU, which will reduce your performance. Now you can go back into the BIOS and adjust it manually if you want to after that, but it is something I just wanna point out to folks that um, you know, depending on how you configure this thing, you may get less performance than we're getting here. Now I just showed you the bottom of the system where we have things like two M.2 drives and we also have a U.2 drive. And I just wanted to see if we installed all those drives all at once, what would be the performance using Crystal Disk Mark? And so we ran the simple Crystal Disk Mark benchmark on all of those and we got 
got performance that um, definitely showed that we had NVMe drives, but they weren't necessarily like crazy fast speeds that we're getting out of these drives. Another item that I think a lot of folks are gonna ask is like, you know, can this push two and a half gig ethernet? Can this push 10 gig ethernet? Guys, like, let me just be very clear. If you have that Intel Atom C3758 processor that we just showed on a recent video, um, well, frankly, that thing can push two 10 gig things. It can run firewalls at two 10 gigs, like 18 gigs or something like that total of traffic. And so something like this, where you have a high speed Core i9 processor with like way more cores and all that kind of stuff, you're gonna have absolutely no problem with the performance of this just using it as a network box. But on the flip side, I would also say that if you were just gonna use this as like a router with like 10 gig like routing or something like that, or you know, a 10 gig firewall, you probably have like way too much CPU in here. Now the system that Minis Forum sent us has six performance cores and eight efficient cores because it has the Core i9-13900H. Frankly, um, that's a really nice processor. Now, there is another option in this, which is a Core i9-12900H, which was the Alder Lake, the previous gen one. And that one had the same core config, had a couple different features, like different clock speeds and stuff like that. But overall, they are largely similar CPUs. And for $130 less, I would have actually probably, if I were buying the system myself, I would probably have gotten that because I think it's just, uh, it's just frankly a little bit better value. But folks, if you're buying a Core i9 mini PC, you probably want the most performance you can. Now, of course, this system also has the Intel Iris XE graphics. And so you have, uh, you know, a okay GPU, not necessarily something that's gonna play like really top end games at this point, but you also get quick sync video. So if you do build like a media server or you just wanna have that kind of video offload, I think that's a really great capability. And it is something that is better than the C3758 system that we saw recently. But I mean, end of the day, this thing has a ton of performance. Now you probably wanna know how much power this thing is using. Cause frankly, I would wanna know too. But uh, I thought of a fun idea. What if instead of doing it here, what if we went and did the power consumption at the new Scottsdale studio set? Let's to that. Welcome to the new set, or at least what we're testing out as a new set. And what you can see is that over here, we have the Minis Forum MS-01 already up and running. And let's talk about this mini system's power in terms of three things. First, we're gonna look at the power at the package, so the CPU package power consumption. We're gonna look at the at the wall power consumption. Then we're gonna look and talk about the overall noise, because this is not a completely silent system. Although in most use cases, the fans are very good in this. Okay, so at idle, the CPU package power consumption is around 10 watts. And what we get on our power meter is somewhere in the 25 to 30 watt range. I'm going to point out right now that we have the system set up in performance mode. And the reason we have it in performance mode is because we were doing benchmarking and we wanna show the same performance numbers as we show power numbers. Now, of course, you can go in the BIOS and there's a lot of settings that you can change and lower this number. I just wanna keep everything consistent. Now, the fans are pretty quiet, but they are definitely audible. This is a 34 and a half DBA noise floor studio and our sound meter that's sitting right here will go up to about 37, 38 DBA with the system. System and idle. So it's not silent, but it's also not super loud. We've definitely heard plenty of much louder systems. And I actually do like the fact that this case is a little bit bigger, which gives you a little bit better cooling in a system like this versus some of the other mini PC form factors out there. Okay, so now we're turning on stress NG and you're gonna see that the package power consumption has gone from 10 watts all the way up to 80 watts at the wall. Our power consumption has gone all the way up to about 115 or so watts. And the fan is starting to spin up. We're gonna eventually get this fan up to maybe 42 to 45 dBA. So it's definitely audible. I can definitely hear it now. But on the other hand, this is remember a 100% CPU utilization test. The other thing that you're gonna see is that our temperatures have now gone into the red range because the fan is still trying to catch up and is ramping up right now. The other thing that you're gonna see in a couple seconds is that this red is gonna start to turn back to that teal blue color. And the reason for that is that our package power consumption is gonna drop from 80 watts down to 60 watts. Our power at the wall will accordingly go down from 115 watts down to about 95 watts. That happens somewhere in that maybe 45, 50 second mark. So you do get a nice little burst of speed, but then on the other hand, it does dial the settings back and the power back. So that way it can keep thermals under control. That by the way, is very standard. Most mini PCs and most laptops and other systems that you buy today in the consumer side will do that. The server side is a little bit different. So we're gonna kind of leave that over there for now. 
Now, one thing I do want to tell you is that if you do add a GPU in the system, this system only has a 180 watt power brick. So adding a GPU is number one, going to be challenging just from a thermal standpoint. But on the other hand, the system itself will lower the package power consumption. So you're not going to get that like 80 watt boost anymore out of the box because you're going to see a lower power limit instituted by the BIOS. Now, of course, you can go in and change all these settings. If you do have enough cooling and you have enough power, you may need to replace the 180 watt power brick with something like a 240, 250 watt brick. But I know some folks are gonna look at this and say like, okay, let's go GPUs. And I just want everybody to keep in mind that there are some challenges with adding GPUs to a system like this. Now, speaking of adding things to a system like this, we have a bunch of cards here. So let's go back to the other set and start plugging things in so we can talk about what works and what doesn't work. Okay, for all of these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. And this one is uh, pretty simple if you just look at it like a normal mini PC. It's awesome that you get 10 gig ethernet, you have a super fast processor, you can get up to 96 gigabytes of memory, and uh, you have a lot of M.2 expansion or U.2 expansion for storage, and you get things like that PCIe slot. But for our key lessons learned, that's fine. I really wanna get to the PCIe slot and talk about what worked, what didn't work, things that surprised us, some design things up, well, let's just get into it. Okay, so the first thing I just wanna show you is the first card that we thought of. You know, we have a low profile slot, so we can go and put something like a, you know, low profile card. It also, you know, has to be a single slot card, so you can't have a dual slot card. There's no power adapter here, so if you need extra power for your card, um, well, you're just kinda of out of luck. And there's also no fan on this side of the system, so I like the idea of having something that's actively cooled. And so that led us to this little QNAP card, but it's the QM2 2P 2G 2T. So this would give you two extra SSDs, two extra network ports, and there's a little PCIe switch here, so you don't have to worry about bifurcation. So we thought like, oh, of course this thing's gonna work. Um, and the answer is that it did not work. Whenever we ran this in the system, the system just gave us a black screen and it never booted. We gave it 30 minutes, just didn't boot. Now, one thing that I found, which was kind of fun, is that we had an old Dell Wise, like uh, 5070 or something like that, that we were gonna do an article on, but then we just kind of ran out of time, so we never did it. It's called an AMD. E9173, and this is a low power GPU that's meant for like thin clients and stuff like that. It has a cooling fan on it, which is really good. And you get a couple of display outputs. So if you are not happy with just having three display outputs, you can get six if you use this card, which is pretty good. And you also see that while we have a PCIe by 16 connector, this only by eight that's populated on the actual uh, little finger here. And that is good because that kind of matches the slot. But one thing I do want to point out is that this only comes with a 180 watt power brick. So if you do go and put something like a big GPU in this somehow and find the way to cool it and all that kind of stuff, then you do have to worry about the power and that 180 watt limit. You're most likely gonna have to go up to a 240 watt power supply. Just, um, it's kind of a bummer. We're gonna have to go buy one of those if you do want something like that. And if you just wanted something like 10 GBase T Ethernet, you can get something like this, a Quantia. This is a NIC Giga, a Quantia AQC 113C NIC. And this thing works no problem. Although uh, we put the full height bracket back on, but it definitely worked in here. So that was awesome. Now, one card that I was super excited about when I first saw this is the Microtik CCR 2004. Now, the reason I'm super excited by this is the fact that this has dual 25 gig Ethernet ports. It has the one gig port, which really you're gonna use for management. Let's call it what it is. And then there is a way to interface this with the system. Now, there are definitely some caveats here. Like the number one caveat, of course, is the fact that uh, this thing really doesn't work in Windows. So, um, you know, we installed it in Windows, you get the device couldn't start, and that just kind of is what it is. Under Linux, you will get this thing to work, and Microtik supports it. So it is an option for you if you want to go and have like a, like a router switch that you can put in here. I think that's actually kind of a cool use case. Let's keep going. And this is a Broadcom 95740, which is also a dual 25 gig ethernet NIC. You'll see that we already have the low profile bracket on here because I wanted to show you what happens when we try installing this in the system. Now I've already taken out the little clip that keeps everything in there. And here's the challenge. It is just slightly too long to be able to fit inside the chassis. When we were doing this testing, there were just a couple little like physical things that we found with this slot that they could improve and make it just a lot easier to work on. And this is one of them. It just needs a couple extra millimeters for this to work. You can actually go and take this faceplate off, and if you do that, it'll fit no problem, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt to do that. Okay, this is an NVIDIA Mellanox ConnectX 4 LX, which was like the 25 gig ethernet adapter back in the day. So there are tons of these things out there. They're absolutely everywhere. And 
uh, frankly, this thing worked no problem. You just plop it in, ready to go, easy peasy. Now, something that was a lot less easy peasy though is this card. Now, this is a quad 10 gig adapter. I think it's like an XL710 or X710 adapter. It's a quad port adapter. And so, you know, you don't really have that much real estate on the back, right, for the different ports. So you have these four SFP plus ports. And when you try putting it in the system, you run into an issue. And hopefully you guys can see this, but what you run into is a weird problem where you have the card about ready to get seated, but then the SFP plus cages protrude just a bit from the back plate. And when they do that, this extra kind of plasticky thing that I don't really know why it's here in the first place gets in the way. And so eventually we did get this card to work. And the way that we fit it in there was we had to go and unlatch this and pull off this back like kind of faceplate thing. And once we did that, we had no problem having an extra four ports of 10 gig ethernet, giving us six total. Okay, now let's get to the storage side. Uh, things that worked well, easy, like little M.2 adapters. If you just want to add an extra M.2 drive, no problem. But of course, folks are going to always want more storage. So we found an old as dirt LSI, or now it's Broadcom uh, SAS 3008E, or 8E, which means that we have eight external ports in these two connectors. And, uh, you know, this one, when we put the low profile bracket in, plopped it in, and it worked no problem. We saw it once we installed the driver in both Windows and worked automatically in Linux. So pretty darn easy to get working. This allows you to do something like connect a SAS JBOD or SATA JBOD and get eight drives connected to the system externally, which is just awesome. Just for giggles, we tried this cheap 9300 series, uh, like 16 port adapter and it uh, did not work at all. We just didn't find it in the system. I have no idea. And one just super easy one while we're at it is, uh, you know, we just showed in our recent C3758 uh, fanless system video, we showed this QNAP unit attached to the back of that system with an SFF8088 to an SFF8087 cable. But the kit actually comes with this little QNAP card, which has a little tiny, not great uh, AS Media SAT, or SATA controller on it. And it came with a low profile bracket and an SFF8088 port. Now this only has half of the ports of that old SAS 3008, but it does have some advantages. Like one, it just worked on everything, both Linux, Windows, no problem, didn't have to worry about it, just worked out of the box. Two, it's so low power that you don't really have to worry about the heat, which is always a challenge in a system like this. And so we took our cable, connected the two, and we had four SATA drives hooked up, 18 terabyte SATA drives. So we could go and create a Windows array easily that we could also take out and move to a different system if we wanted, like that little fanless box that we reviewed recently. One really cool thing Thing if you want more drives is that we were able to install the eight port card that came with the QNAP TLD800S into the system. Two cables later, and we had 18 eight terabyte drives for a total of 144 terabytes that we had installed and were ready to use. If you just want to have a lot of hard drive storage, this is a pretty easy way to go do that. And we also tried some kind of like really hot uh, PCIe SSDs, some things like a Bluefield 2 DPU. Um, there are things that worked in the slot, but on the other hand, they were so hot because they're pushing so much power that um, you know I just didn't really feel comfortable telling folks that they should put in a system like this. So I think that my kind of just general, just after playing with this for about a week and throwing just tons of different cards in here, something I would say is that like, if it's under 25 watts, you're probably okay. 15 under 15, I feel pretty comfortable about. Um, but then once you start getting over like 25 watts, you're definitely going to start noticing that cooling is going to become a challenge. So I do think that there are folks that are going to figure out how to mod this thing and get cooling onto these cards, especially if they want to run higher power cards on here. But I know based on the first piece that we did on this, that this is going to be a popular system. But I also know that a lot of people are going to have just seen this key lesson learned and be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So what I think we should do is we're going to create a form thread on the STH forms. We're just going to go and like make a place where we're going to go list some cards that we found working in the MS-01. I'm going to put the ones that we found and we tested that worked that didn't work. So that way folks don't have to redo the same work. But I do have an ask. If you do get one of these systems, you do put a card in, well, go to that form post and go and put like what works because I think that's super important that we do that as a community so that way we can utilize this little system as well as possible. Hey guys, I know this is a long video, but I also knew that we were going to be one of the first ones to review this and I wanted to be thorough. I didn't want to just say like, oh, this has everything and it just everything works. There are weird things in this, like that little plastic nub that means that you can't put in quad port NICs, for example. Some things just don't work. There's an SSD destructo switch and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to make sure that we could be as thorough as possible while also getting this out as fast as we could. So if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.